the origin of this conference is, was originally, before it was called Global Empowerment, it was called Blue Sky. And the intent was to like explore the boundaries. And so I'm going to explore the boundaries of what you think by arguing that actually a principal obstacle to the rule of law is the law. That the law that exist are actually not a positive but a negative for establishing anything like the capability to enforce the law. Um, so I want to start with just some quick basics like what is, what, when we say state capacity or state capability, what do we mean? I mean when I say state capability for policy implementation, I mean a very specific thing, which is what a policy does is it establishes a mapping between facts and actions by agents. So a procurement policy says, here are the facts about the world, here's what the procurement agent should do. But the actual policy is determined by a whole variety of things beyond the formal policy. And in some sense, what I mean by state capability is the ability of those two things to align so that the policies that actually achieve the desired outcomes are in practice what the agents do. When those two things have huge gaps between them, you don't accomplish the public purpose objectives, and we call that a weak capability for implementation because the state can't induce its agents to take the actions it needs to take given the facts to accomplish the objective. When, what do we mean by the big stuck? We did it as part of the book that Matt Andrews and Michael Wilcock and I wrote. We did an analysis of the ways in which kind of an omnibus measure of state capability um, evolved over 1996 to 2012, which was the longest span we could uh, look at it. And this is by whether or not it was growing over that period, and this is by whether it was strong to start with. And this table has four key findings in it. First, there's very few successes. We take kind of a threshold of strong capability of being kind of Portugal. Uruguay is just below this, Portugal is just above that threshold. So that's kind of, kind of it's as weak a state as you can be and still play in the league with Germany, you know? It's kind of a weak, it's a weak OECD state. There's only eight countries from, that we're developing that are managed to be above this. So when we talk about the, in some sense, surprisingly weak ability to acquire state capability that both Frank and uh, Jim talked about in different ways, that's partly what we mean. Second is that there's very many weak states. So these states are kind of Libya, Papua New Guinea, Mozambique. These are quite weak states, less than a ranking of four on a zero to ten scale, and half of the countries of the world are still in this very weak capability position. Um, third, 70 of the 102 countries are going backwards. So it's not like, oh, well, there's convergence or we're catching up. There is a big stock. More than half of the countries um, over this period, 30 rapid, 40 slow, saw deterioration rather than strengthening of capability. And lastly, even for those making positive progress, the rates of improvement are very, very slow. So by if we just extrapolate the progress over this period into the future, only eight more countries would join the high capability states by 2100. <laughs> by which time I'll be dead, many of us will be dead. So even if we forecast into the far future the slow rate of growth, we're not producing many more highly capable states. So that's what we mean by the big stuck. Um, and when you look at the big stuck, this is just an exercise we've done of saying, take a current fragile state like a Nigeria, that on this state capability is rankings of the World Bank is kind of Nigeria's at minus one on a sort of minus two and a half to positive two and a half scale. Say, well, how long would it take them at various rates of growth that we are currently observing to get to Costa Rica? Well, the answer is at the average rate of growth <laughs> observed on average, since the growth of nearly all of these indicators is negative, it takes forever. Like, it's a big stock. It's not like, how soon will we get there? Well, you're still in reverse. You're not even going the right direction yet, so it's going to take forever. And even when it's not forever, it's, you know, <laughs> 2,000 years. So that's kind of forever. I'm, a, I'm an economist, I discount the future. <laughs> 2,000 is forever. Um, and even at the pace of the fastest countries, 
we see of the, even if we say, okay, suppose Nigeria could somehow manage to achieve the growth of a capability of the 20 fastest capability acquiring countries, it's still going to take them 60 years because it's just hard to do and it's going to take a long time and it's a hard slog. So I'm going to talk about one reason why we think this big stock exists and it's what we call premature load bearing. And the kind of meta easiest way to think about this is think of an army and think what an army can do on the parade ground in terms of its ability to inflict damage on the the enemy. You know, you're firing some shells, you're carrying out some exercises, but you're doing it on the parade ground, or you're doing it in an exercise where nobody's shooting back. You have one capability, but the question with an army is how robust is your capability with respect to people shooting at you? And what happens in actual battle is at some point the army turns into a mob. The army loses its kind of organization and cohesiveness and its fighting effectiveness drops precipitously. And this is kind of a, the maximum stress this unit can sustain. And so part of what building capability means is not improving this, but improving this. How much, you know, how long can I sustain stress? Um, and our, my argument is um, the way to destroy state capability is to put your organization under more stress than it can handle. Like if you want to destroy your army, throw it into a battle that it can't win. Because not only it, it will destroy whatever capability it has, and kind of what's happening in the world is that like on taxes, for instance, poor countries are adopting tax codes that are higher, more complex to implement than the capability of their tax agents to actually adhere to those tax codes. And the pressure from taxpayers to deviate from implementing the tax code destroys the organization. So instead of being an organization of tax officials, it essentially becomes a collection of illicit rent collectors, right? And the problem is, is this becomes a low level equilibrium that you can't change. No amount of training of tax agents is going to make any difference to the actual realized behavior of these tax agents. It's not that they don't know what to do, it's that you've put them under too much pressure. So, um, so my sort of <laughs> controversial, hopefully, thesis statement is transplanting good and especially best practice laws and policies on tax, on regulation, on environment, on safety, on education actually destroys state capability because you bring in something that isn't adapted to the actual capability and you're throwing your army into battles they can't win. And by throwing your army into battles they can't win, you destroy your army. You not only lose the battle, you destroy your army. Um, and so <laughs> the pithy phrase is, good law destroys rule of law. So it's aren't that these aren't good laws, these are terrific laws for Denmark. These are terrific laws for the UK. But if they're maladapted to the capability, but you know, what makes Denmark Denmark is it has this huge robustness with respect to the capability of its organization such that they're able to induce their agents to implement complex and demanding policies and laws that just doesn't exist. And if it doesn't exist, you don't get there by putting the law in place and marching to it. Um, that has the opposite effect. So I just want to give one example from super recent research where <laughs> unbelievably in some sense we were able to empirically find some evidence for this thesis. Uh, you would think this would be hard to prove because we're talking about the gap between the law and the reality. Observing the gap between the law and the reality is hard because everybody's incentive is to hide it. But the World Bank, bless its heart, went out and did two different things. It created the doing business indicators of the number of days it would take to get a construction permit if you followed the law. And then the same countries that actually asked firms how long it took them to get a construction permit. So we have some rough indicator of the de jure and the de facto in the same countries at the same time. And here's what the distribution looks like. <laughs> here's the distribution of the doing business indicators of what they think the law says. And the median is 190 days. On average, it takes you six months to get a permit. 
When you ask firms how long it took them to get a permit, two-thirds of them say less than 45 days, a third of them say less than 15. And the beauty of this is this is not a small difference that we need to worry about statistical significance and method. Like the difference between 15 and 190, like <laughs> we're not too much, we, we can, that gets by on the FO test. Um, <clears throat> so, and by the way, the minimum doing business of any country is 60 days. So nearly all firms in nearly all countries actually get their permits faster than the slow, than, than the fastest law would say if you follow the procedures you should. Moreover, in low capability countries with high, we have a lot of countries that have both super low capability and super high regulations on the books and what they have is the maximal numbers of quick deals. And we're kind of assuming that if you're getting your permit in 15 days, you're in just complete non-compliance. You've bought your way as out of the regulation, essentially. So in Sudan, <laughs> the regulation is 270 days, and 93% of the firms report getting a permit in less than 15. So basically, um, the rules of the game in Sudan are that there are no rules. And this is a scene from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid where they're trying to decide on what are the rules of a knife fight. <laughs> it's like there are no rules of a knife fight, it's a knife fight. So, you know, when we talk about institutions and the rules of the game, we sometimes mislead ourselves that the rules of the game are rules. But the rules of the game aren't rules. The rules of the game is whatever deal you can get in whatever way you can get it. Sometimes you get a deal by being brother-in-law of the president. Sometimes you get a deal by paying off the inspector. Sometimes you get a deal by just staying under the radar and not actually asking for the permit. There's all kinds of ways of accommodating yourselves to a regulatory environment that's way too stringent relative to the capability for enforcement. But once that happens, we, just, we do a cross-national regression of the type that is widely and deservedly in ill repute. We do a cross-national regression and we say, what kind of countries have a large proportion of quick deals, firms with less than 15 days in compliance? And it turns out the association is, <laughs> this is the line, this is the percent of, this is the, the and I'm going to call it the effect and you'll all forgive me, the effect of in, increasing the regulation by 100 days of the proportion of firms that get quick deals. So you would think if I make the regulation more strict, fewer firms get quick deals. In low capability countries, particularly those that start with high levels of regulation, increasing the strictness of the law increases the fraction of firms that get quick deals. What have you done? You've just shattered your organization's ability to enforce anything so by making a very strict, gold-plated, you know, world standard law, you actually reduce compliance. And by then, the problem is, once you've reduced compliance, you're in a very difficult big stuck. Why? Because <clears throat> you make a law that's out of touch and it makes it costly to do business. Deals emerge that actually allow firms to do business. But then that means the feature of large successful firms is their ability to secure favorable deals. They're not the productive firms, they're the deal-making firms. Once you're in that situation, the organized capability for implementation is weakened or destroyed on purpose because the people who are powerful don't want it. Right? Once the people doing business in your country are doing business in ways that are inconsistent with the existing laws, the idea that you would build the capability to enforce those laws is ridiculous. And then you get a perfect storm because the advocates for whatever it is, labor regulation, environmental relation, taxes, if you go to them and say, we need to reduce the law's stringency by an order of magnitude in order to, <laughs> in order to enforce it, like go to an environmental NGO and say, our key to improving environmental performance is weakening the environmental regulations by an order of magnitude. No, they want strict laws, so they stick with strict laws. The powerful business wants strict laws because their comparative advantage is deals that exempt them from the strict laws, so they're happy with strict laws because they want strict laws and good deals for them, 
and they can keep competitors out by differential enforcement. And the organization essentially you know, accommodates itself to its new role as a mediator, as a rent mediator or collector, willfully loses control of the facts. I stop collecting the real facts about emissions or the real facts about compliance. And then I don't have anything to become a learning organization on because I've deliberately ceded. I don't want to know the facts that would put me in the position of knowing I'm not enforcing the law. So there's an example, Bang, smart Bunch MIT economists went to India. They decided to implement a project that was going to increase incentives for nurses to show up for their job in Rajasthan, India. Um, they implemented it in the usual randomized controlled trial way. They found the legally and juridically recorded absence of nurses went down. So that's good. Except <laughs> the actual presence of the nurses went down too. <laughs> And if you think they must be present or absent, you haven't really been a bureaucrat. <laughs> the world's much more complex than that. Such a black and white attitude. Um, and what went up was there was a category in which the nurses were exempt from being at their duty station but not penalized for the absence. So what happened? You increased the stakes of them being juridically present and they became more juridically present, but less physically present. And kind of what matters when you show up is not whether the nurse is juridically present, right? It's whether there's actually someone there. So this is exactly a case where trying to increase the stakes to increase performance actually led to worse performance because you destroyed the facts. So now if you go back to the government and says you have an absenteeism problem with nurses, they say, no, 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 look, we're world class, only 9% absence of our nurses. So you've actually destroyed the ability to even become a learning state about how to make nurses attend more because according to the official statistics, they're there. So um, <clears throat> finally, <laughs> who are the vectors of this disease of premature load bearing causing destru destructions, lose, lose, lose. This is lose, lose, lose. It destroys state capability, it doesn't accomplish the public purpose, and it just creates kind of, wow, I still have five minutes. Uh, I have a story to tell. Um, I'm not giving you more time. <laughs> yeah, okay, so the vectors of this are global experts from rich countries. They come and they say, in Denmark, here's how we do it. And yeah, that's true. That's how you do it in Denmark. But it's like being a you know, brain surgeon and say, when I do brain surgery at Mass General, I do this and I do that and I do the other and I do the other. And it's like, that's terrific for you. But I don't have any of those things in rural Tanzania, right? It's consultants who peddle best practice solutions. Um, <coughs> I won't name any, <laughs> I was going to mention names, but I won't. Um, <laughs> you know, consultants go around and what do they do? They say, our job is to move knowledge about best practice from here to there. That's what they do for a living. Um, development agencies who insist on wishful thinking goals rather than achievable progress, who come in and say, oh, we'll give you money, but first in Yemen, you have to establish a world-class you know, PPP strategy. Well, that's wishful thinking rather than achievable goals. And if these vectors land on you, slap them. <laughs> Just slap them, get rid of them. They're not helping. They're actually creating a nuisance. And if we reduce the vector, we can actually then focus on the learning state or PDAA that Matt's going to talk about. We can actually hopefully put ourselves in a position where we can surface the problems and learn about them rather than pretend we have solutions and not learn about them. Thank you very much. <laughs>